So welcome today to our Forest for the Birds webinar series. And today you'll be hearing from Dr. Darren Sleep and Dr. Darren Miller about conservation on private lands. And so before I turn things over to Shannon Connors to, to well, in fact, I'm gonna turn things over to Shannon Connors right now to, to talk a little bit about um, issues for today's technology. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so welcome everybody. The Forest for the Birds Conserving America's Forest Birds webinar series is jointly sponsored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center, Forest Ecology Working Group, and Migratory Bird Program, and I will paste this uh, contact information into the chat box. And just a quick disclaimer, this product is for educational purposes only. The views, opinions, or positions expressed in this webinar series are those of the guest presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or positions of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of the Interior. Some of the materials and images may be protected by copyright or may have been licensed to us by a third party and are restricted in their use. Mention of any product names, companies, web links, textbooks, or other references does not imply federal endorsement. And I will turn things back over to Jeff to introduce Darren Sleep and Darren Miller. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Shannon. Again, my name is Jeff Horan. I'm a forest ecologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Refuge Program, and I'm in the North Atlantic Appalachian region. And I'm also with our forest ecology working group, which worked with partners uh, like NCTC and the Migratory Birds Program to create this series and thanks to Shannon Connors and Jim Siegel from NCTC and our forest bird team for all their help on this. So I just wanted to, to have a quick programming note for, for those who have been part of this series. We've had a lot of success with this. This is our eighth webinar, but I wanted to give you guys a heads up that this is a programming note that we're going to switch platforms from actually WebEx to Zoom in it for our next part of the series. That's a contractual issue with Fish and Wildlife Service. So we have 1,300 people that are registered for the next, each of the next four webinars. And so I suspect you, will, you should look in your email in the coming days and you may get an email asking you to re-register for those. So I just wanted to mention that if you see it and, and if you get a cancellation note, which I don't think we're, we're trying not to allow that to happen, um, at any rate, we're still going to have our webinars. They'll just be on a Zoom platform, and you will get a request to uh, go ahead and, and join those. So before I introduce uh, Dr. Sleep and Dr. Miller, I need to say just a few more things. Shannon mentioned we're going to have, uh, we're going to stop for questions both at the end of uh, Darren Sleep's presentation, and then again at, when both Darren uh, Miller and Darren Sleep are finished, and so you guys will have question, have an opportunity to ask questions of both. And as a moderator, I'll pick just a couple questions out for those guys to hit hit on. And then I also wanted to say our next webinar nine. I'll just run a quick commercial. That's on November 16th. It's at the same time, one o'clock Eastern Daylight Time, or we'll say Eastern Time for now. And and that's integrating indigenous and traditional practices into bird-friendly forest management. And that's Frank Lake from the U.S. Forest Service. Now, finally, I'd like to introduce Dr. Darren Sleep and Dr. Darren Miller. So first, Dr. Sleep is the Senior Director of Conservation Strategies with the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, that's SFI, where he focuses, focuses on growing SFI's conservation and science credentials and on increasing SFI's capacity to develop and manage conservation projects in both Canada and the United States. Darren sits on a number of government and NGO advisory bodies, including the Committee on Status of Species at Risk in Ontario. And he also is part of the Boreal team of specialists for the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. And then he, he also is on the, pri the primary forest team with the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Prior to joining SFI, Darren worked on as a project leader in forest ecology at the National Council for Air and Stream Improvement, where he worked on issues of relevance to the forest sector and with scientific and conservation bi biology communities. Darren holds a PhD in, in zoology from the University of Guove in Ontario, Canada. So, and then before, before Darren Sleep gets started, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention Darren Miller, Dr. Darren Miller is a certified wildlife biologist and a fellow of the Wildlife Society. 
He is the Vice President of Forestry Programs for the National Council on Air and Stream Improvement, and you'll note that both Darren and Darren had similar jobs. In this role, he oversees a comprehensive research and technical support program that addresses environmental consequences of forest management across the U.S. He previously spent 21 years with Warehouser Company in several environmental research roles. He received a BS in Wildlife Management from Eastern Kentucky and an MS in Wildlife Ecology and a PhD in forest resources with an emphasis on wildlife ecology from Mississippi State. Darren is a recent past president of the Wildlife Society and a professional member of the Boone and Crockett Club. So to get us started, it's Dr. Sleep. Please take it away, Dr. Sleep. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thanks for that introduction and, and for going through all that stuff about uh, Dr. Miller and I. Uh, we did share a, a very common past in some ways, but we should, we're quick to point out that we did not work at NCASI at the same time. Uh, otherwise, he would have been my boss, which would have been odd. Not that he's an odd guy, but anyway. Uh, so thanks for this opportunity to talk about bird-friendly forestry on corporate lands and uh, with specific emphasis on forest certification program. I think you're going to see there's a lot of cross-pollination between Dr. Miller's presentation and my own. Uh, and that's uh, uh, a little bit deliberate and a little bit because of the, the stuff that we work on uh, tends to overlap a lot, both in, in collaborative nature and in, in the science that we're doing. First, uh, to give you a bit of a background for those of you who may not know what SFI is or, or what we do, we have this overwhelming vision of a world that values and, man uh, values and benefits from sustainably managed forests. And of course, we do this, and you're going to see this throughout this presentation, we, we achieve this vision through advancing sustainability with forest focused collaboration. So that's what we're all about. We collaborate with a number of partners across the spectrum from conservation organizations, research organizations, corporate partners, private landowners, uh, and, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service and, and Canadian agencies as well. So uh, collaboration is, is what we're all about. We work on a, a number of issues within SFI, and you can see that they sort of touch on not just uh, environmental issues, but social issues as well, including uh, green jobs. You know, in Canada, we place uh, over 3,000 green jobs with youth uh, at this point across the uh, conservation and forestry sectors. We work with uh, growing future leaders for educational programs, K to 12 uh, development, and that sort of thing. Uh, we're always talking about carbon and climate and packaging for the planet, and so on and so forth. But in particular, uh, what we're going to talk about today, because we're focusing on birds, we focus a lot on species recovery and species maintenance. Uh, so, so this is really a, a relevant topic for the work we do. We divide our work stream into four broad uh, pillars or categories. Uh, so this, this picture sort of depicts the, the four categories of work that SFI does. Uh, we're best known uh, as our, through our standard, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative or SFI standard. Uh, that I'll be talking about extensively today, but we also have a pillar of work through our education initiative through PLT project learning tree in the US and PLT Canada, uh, where we develop educational materials for kids from uh, K to 12 uh, in Canada. We've actually extended that though. We're not so much developing educational materials in Canada, but we're developing career development materials and mentoring systems to allow students to go from that high school experience through university and into a career in the, in the forest and conservation sectors. Uh, we also do a lot of work in community, uh, in particular around a, lo a lot of disenfranchised communities, uh, helping ensure that all of society's benefits from, from sustainably managed forests. And then finally, we have our conservation pillar where I work, uh, where we do a lot of conservation research and collaborative uh, projects across North America. Uh, SFI is governed by a three-chambered board. You can see here the, the current uh, organizations that, are, that sit on our board. Uh, from the economic, environmental, and social pillars. So you can see the, the different logos from, from the number of different organizations that sit on our board currently. And this is a CEO-led board. So the folks who sit on this board tend to be the CEOs of these organizations that meet uh, three times a year usually to, to help guide our work. The key to what we're going to focus on today really is that uh, fundamentally we believe that forests play this pivotal role in the maintenance of biodiversity. Uh, in obviously, this is a forest for birds webinar, so we're talking about birds specifically, but we really do believe that the sustainably managed forests have this massive role to play across North America in maintaining and conserving biodiversity. And that's, that's an important element of, of what we do in the way we think about forests. 
Uh, as I said before, our work tends to be viewed. A lot of people look at SFI and they don't see all those other parts of our program because, because they tend to focus on the fact that we have a forest management standard. Uh, and so as a re result, I'm going to sort of focus this talk through our standards. So you understand how our standards relate to forest birds. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of value in sustainable forest management certification, and you can see that in this image, I've, I've sort of broken out some of the different uh, sectors or uh, parts of society that really benefit from sustainably uh, managed forests and from SFM certification. Uh, we have markets where customers, uh, you know, can then uh, um, brand their sustainably proven supply chains. That's useful in terms of, of markets and market share. The forest sector, of course, is is constantly uh, having to verify their social license to operate uh, by meeting the expectations of consumers and the public. The government, in, in many cases, is considered sort of the, the backstop as being responsible for the forest within their jurisdictions. Uh, so there's not just uh, legislative bodies like the, the Lacey Act and things like that that help them do that, but there's also a sort of a responsibility to look after it. And certification provides, you know, that, that sort of assuredness for those uh, government agencies that their forests are being well managed as a third party that goes out and takes a look at things. And finally, consumers are increasingly aware of um, environmental issues and are constantly looking for ways to assure that their buying power is used in a way that benefits the environment. So there's this, there's this increasing environmental awareness of green labels. But the one thing that we often forget to mention is this uh, sustainable certification uh, mechanism that allows us to essentially float all boats and raise the, the standard for, uh, for forestry across the board has an environmental benefit. So, you know, you're going to see here in a minute how much area SFI actually impacts on. So if we make one small change to the standard that is doable and workable for, for certified organizations to, to, to enact on their lands, and we have a massive footprint, we can have a, a large uh, positive effect on the environment. Uh, and that's one of the things that we really focus on in SFI. Our standards, uh, this diagram essentially just shows the, the three standards that uh, SFI manages. One is our forest management standard where I'm going to focus my comments uh, today, but we also have our fiber sourcing standard and that's really directed at uh, private landowners who are often too small to be fully certified. So what happens is a fiber sourcing organization, a company essentially, that wants to buy fiber from those private landowners, they themselves can be fiber sourcing certified. And therefore, uh, when, they're, when they're negotiating with landowners to buy fiber from their land, they can say, yes, we'd like to buy your fiber, but we'd like to use certified loggers who know what they're doing, who can uh, make sure that environmental values are protected like streamside management zones and, and what have you. Uh, so that uh, basically increases the sustainability of those forests that are being uh, used as fiber sourcing. And the third standard is our SFI chain of custody, which is a, a means of tracking uh, fiber through the supply chain uh, to you know, prevent things like illegal logging and, and, and things like that. So that's a way of, of sort of tracking the fiber as it comes through the entire supply chain from the, from the forest all the way to the product. As I said, SFI has a very large impact in North America. This graph shows sort of the increasing uh, trend in, in the amount of area certified to uh, SFI forest management standard. You can see that we have roughly 370 million acres in North America right now. And, and you know, that really means that, again, any small changes, any small adjustments, you know, based on science, based on, on new information, allows us to really impact the landscape at a broad scale and make these positive changes. So you can see here, this chart shows from uh, 2000 to, to 2020, so 20 year time, you can see SFI has continued to build on its land base of area certified to the SFI standard as compared to some of our other uh, North American competitors, uh, FSC, uh, CSA, that's the Canadian Standards Association and the American Tree Farm System, uh, all of which uh, are also operating uh, at the North American scale. But because of this, uh, you know, large, large area that we impact, we have, uh, you know, according to this number, 375 million. So I said it is roughly 370, 375 million acres that are certified. Uh, and that's in addition, of course, to the tens of millions of acres that are influenced by the SFI fiber sourcing standard, which I talked about earlier. We have 34 grassroots, uh, what, what are called our six, our, our standard implementation committees. 
Uh, these folks are the, are the folks that get together at the state or sometimes the provincial level in Canada to talk about how to implement the standard and really bring that grassroots expertise uh, into play. Uh, we also, because SFI has a requirement for research, uh, and we track that over time. We look at how much money has gone into this research. We know that SFI certified companies have invested nearly 1.8 billion dollars into forest research uh, since 1995. So, you know, from a from the position of a researcher, which is where I've I've spent most of my career, this is a huge contribution to to really getting better at what we do in terms of forest management and better understanding these ecological systems that we're working in. And then, you know, we've got this educational impact of uh, over 140 million students that have been reached since uh, Project Learning Tree in the US began. So having this large impact really makes a difference in terms of these positive uh, benefits, not just to the environment, but to society as a whole. But if we start focusing a little bit more on, on, the, on the bird issue, uh, and, and, you know, we know that we have a number of requirements within our standard that directly impact birds. Uh, so we have uh, stand and landscape level conservation uh, indicators. Uh, there's a requirement for a diversity of forest types and age classes. Uh, provincial or state conservation planning is important to what we do and is, is built into the standard. Uh, there's also uh, you know, a, a built-in role for natural disturbance and then what we call forests with exceptional conservation values. So these are forest areas that are associated with uh, uh, T&E species, uh, including birds. And, and finally, the other piece that, as I've already mentioned earlier, there's this unique requirement among our SFM standards for collaborative forest research to inform future forest management. So if we're going to you know, get better at what we do, we need research to do that. We need to better understand uh, the ecological systems uh, and better understand the, the relationship between good forest management and how it impacts those ecological systems. So this is a really important component to certification. Uh, now, these indicators, they influence management at various scales. So there's, this, is a, this diagram is uh, sort of these concentric circles, if you're concentric ellipses, perhaps, of uh, coarse filters, meso filters, and fine filters that influence the way we think about forest management. So at the coarsest level, at the landscape level, these are broad scale. We think about forest types. We think about structure stages, multi-species. Uh, this is the very highest level that a forest management will look at their landscape and say, okay, you know, what am I trying to accomplish over the long term? And then if we go down a little bit further to a finer scale, a meso scale, if you will, it's where the forest manager might start focusing on key habitat elements through design retention, for example, snags, uh, legacy trees, things like that. Uh, thinking about what some groups of species may need uh, to, to thrive on their landscape. And then finally, you get all the way down to the fine filter where there's something specific that one species might need that you have to do a specific piece of management for, for that particular species. Now, our standard is built such that all these levels get hit and are required within certified uh, forests uh, to be successfully uh, certified to SFI. And I'm gonna give you a working example of that because this is very uh, sort of theoretical uh, and, and hard to sort of grasp. So I wanted to give a, a a solid uh, example. So the, the working example I'm gonna use here is the Canada Warbler. So the Canada Warbler is a neotropical migrant uh, in, in, uh, in North America, migrates uh, from South America up to the uh, Eastern US and, and breeds primarily in Canada, a little bit in the Northern States. You can see its distribution there on the right side of the map. Um, it is considered threatened in Canada uh, and it's, it ranks sort of by at the state level or state or province level, it, it goes from critically endangered to secure depending on where you are in, in, the, in the continent. And in any case, it's highly dependent on forests across its entire range. So how does the SFI standard apply to this particular species? How would it, how would it work? If we look at at the sort of the habitat elements or criteria that you would think if you, that you'd use if you were if you were managing uh, for Canada warble on your landscape, here are the the different pieces of the of the, what we know about this this critter that, that would allow us to think about management. Now it's important to note that the SFI standard is outcome oriented rather than prescriptive. The last thing I think any certified organization wants is for a guy like me who lives in uh, in Ontario, Canada to come down to uh, Georgia and tell them how to do their, their forest management. So instead, we actually set an outcome that we, are, that we expect certified organizations to reach, and they come up with a way to do it. 
Uh, we collaborate. Uh, we expect collaboration across multiple uh, landowners and stakeholders. That's back to that uh, standard implementation committee where grassroots folks get together and talk about how they can achieve uh, the SFI uh, uh, requirements. Uh, it's a very transparent process, both in terms of how our standard works and, and when we revise the standard every five years, we just completed a, a standard revision process. Very transparent, anyone is allowed to participate. And finally, it's important to note that the criteria and indicators that we apply, they hit at these multiple spatial scales from coarse all the way to fine filter. So, for example, threatened endangered species, uh, we expect certified organizations to have a program built into their forest management to protect these threatened endangered species, as well as a program to locate and protect known sites for these species. So this is a very coarse filter, obviously. You've got a, a species on your landscape that is threatened or endangered. We expect certified organizations to know they're, that, they've, that they're managing for these species and, and have a program to protect them, as well as uh, a system to locate them and know where they are on their landscape. If they're relevant to, a, to the forest and they're relevant to a, a particular landscape, we expect our organizations to understand that. It's a very coarse filter, uh, but it, it's a start. Then we, we think about, um, you know, the species in particular has a wide range of deciduous, conifer, and mixed forests that it uses. Again, it's a very coarse filter landscape level scale. But again, we expect our certified organizations to have a program uh, to either individually or collaboratively uh, work uh, to, you know, maintain a diverse uh, type of forest cover type on their land, uh, age and size class, uh, and to think about all these things at a very broad landscape scale. Again, it's a, a coarse filter. But this species in particular, we know relies on a well-developed shrub layer and structurally complex forest floor. This gets into a slightly tighter um, spatial scale. It's a bit of a meso filter. So, you know, we would expect our certified organizations to have a de develop criteria and implement practices, uh, again, as guided by, you know, best scientific information in the region to think about stand level wildlife habitat elements that are required to maintain this species. So again, that's a bit of a meso filter. We know this species requires riparian shrub forests. Again, under performance measure 3.2, we've got indicators to protect riparian shrub forests, uh, to map them as, as might be the case, and uh, to document uh, these programs uh, you know, across their landscape as to how they're doing this. So that when someone comes knocking and says, how are you maintaining these conservation values? How are you maintaining this particular riparian shrub forest for this particular species? How are you doing it? They, they can present that documentation. Uh, and then a couple of other um, uh, meso filters. We know this species relies on regenerating stands. So there's gotta be you know, documentation of your reforestation plans, how you're going to uh, manage these stands over the long term. Uh, and then there's also under 2.1, there's uh, indicators two and four that again, provide that clear criteria to adequately judge regeneration. Are your forests being regenerated properly? Uh, and then to protect you know, these, uh, these areas of natural regeneration. If you're going to leave an area to naturally, re naturally regenerate, that area has to be protected during uh, uh, ongoing management. And finally, we know this species uh, relies to undergone old growth forests with canopy openings, as well as a well developed shrub layer. And under performance measure 4.2, we have an indicator that talks about uh, supportive and participation in programs for the conservation of old growth forests. So, all of these criteria and indicators would be audited. An uh, auditor would come in and take a look at these. I should say also, if you go back and, and review these, uh, these criteria and indicators, these are all from our revised standard that will be fully implemented as of January of 2022. Uh, but most of these pieces were in our previous standard. There's just some slight uh, word changes that have been added. Uh, this particular species, the Canada Warbler, has no fine filter applications uh, short of if a, a forester were to identify a Canada Warbler nest it would have to be seasonally avoided until the end of that breeding season. So, you know, if you, if you spot, oh my goodness, there's a Canada warbler nest right there, there would be a desire to put a buffer around it uh, to, uh, to avoid that, at least for that season. This is not a species that reuses the same nest year over year. Um, so the standards are built to provide that flexibility to incorporate local knowledge and expertise and is adaptable to all forest dwelling species. So all bird species that, that rely on the forest would be captured under this uh, under our standards. 
I mentioned earlier about our, uh, our research requirement. This pie chart you see here talks about the um, almost 59 million that's uh, in forest research that was invested uh, since, uh, uh, this was 59 million invested in 2017. Uh, since 1995, as I mentioned, 1.6 billion has been invested by our certified organizations. They break down into a variety of, of uh, different topical areas, but you can see that about 14% of that 1.6 billion went into wildlife and fish. Uh, so, you know, there's a, a huge engine here that we've created that generates research on forest management. But we recognize that in some cases, these are, these are very specific to what that certified organization is interested in. And there may be more broad general questions that we would like them to ask. So SFI about six years ago, uh, started the SFI conservation grants program. And these, uh, these grants that we, you know, out of our budget, we dole out to uh, collaborators, be they universities or, or uh, you know, in some cases they're uh, NGOs who are interested in doing this work. Uh, but we emphasize projects here that really demonstrate or establish methodologies to demonstrate the conservation values of SFI certification or SFI certified forests uh, on forest lands. I know uh, Dr. Miller will talk a little bit about some of these projects that that in Cassie's in, involved with. But just very broadly, and I'm going to leave uh, leave the details of this uh, for Dr. Miller. Uh, the managing the forest for birds, this was primarily a, an initiative of the American Bird Conservancy with some money from SFI in collaboration with NCASI. Uh, this really was a project about looking how uh, sustainably managed forests can really benefit uh, bird habitats and bird species in the US Southeast and Pacific Northwest. I, I believe Darren's got some, some data to talk about this. Uh, and we've also done a, a similar project with uh, the American Bird Conservancy and the Boreal Avian Modeling Project uh, in the lake states, uh, sort of in central Canada, located around BCR 12 or Bird Conservation Region 12. Uh, and we're, we're really trying to apply some of those things we learned in the southeast and in the northwest uh, to the lake states area, uh, tipping into Canada a little bit in the northwestern Ontario. So this is some, some really interesting uh, you know, research and, and projects that we're involved with on birds currently. Uh, the SFI Conservation Grant uh, Program is, uh, been growing since 2010. Lots and lots of different organizations have, have benefited. We've collaborated with a number of people. And the great thing is it allows us to not just have SFI connect with all these organizations, but to connect these organizations with each other. So we often find uh, one year we'll have two separate organizations apply for funding. And then after a few years, we'll see those two organizations come together and apply for funding. So there's this uh, increasing uh, synergy and networking that goes on. The key to all of this, I think, is that as we continue to do research and we get more knowledge, we can improve practices over the long term, uh, getting better at what we do through the adaptive management cycle. Um, this is really, I think, the key to how standards work. We get better as we learn more, uh, as opposed to just, you know, randomly telling people to do something different. We are actually doing things based on the science that we collect the data on. Uh, and I think that's actually a, a great transition as we talk about science and research to hand it over to Dr. Miller and let him uh, uh, take over. Because really for us, this is all about providing assurances of well-managed forests to the public and to other stakeholders, that's important, but also using this to, to generate a better understanding on the conservation field for biodiversity, carbon, water, uh, and, and things like that. So that's, that's really what, what SFI is trying to do. With that, I'm going to, uh, uh, stop sharing my screen and pass it back to Dr. Miller and let him take over. Or maybe Jeff, you want to uh, uh, interject a little bit. Yeah, before before Dr. Miller grabs the baton, oh, there's a couple good questions in the um, in the chat. And so I, this is one I think, uh, Dr. Sleep, you can answer pretty quickly. This one, there, again, there's a number of good ones, but some would take a little more explanation. But this one, Jennifer asks, is providing habitat for TNE species required to be SFI certified? If so, is there a minimum number of species that need to be managed for? And again, I think this is, it, it, with within the Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, we're thinking about, you know, how would certification, for instance, um, help encourage management for some of these species on our land. So if you can take a shot at that. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a actually a fairly straightforward question. If there are known element occurrences for a species on a uh, particular forest management landscape, then yes, all those species need to be uh, um, accounted for. Now, in some cases, that might be through a very coarse filter approach. If you've got uh, a teeny species that is you know highly dependent on riparian areas, and the company in question manages that through just maintaining riparian areas without without disturbing them that's that's sufficient for us there's not a you know there's not a specific need to go in and count every square yard of of habitat for a particular species it's it's all about um you know using a coarse filter now in some cases there are species that do require that that more closely monitored fine filter approach of of thinking about exactly where its occurrences are and what uh, different uh, elements of the uh, forest environment it requires to to be maintained, uh, and that requires uh, more effort. But there's there's certainly no uh, there's certainly no minimum uh, in terms of the number of species that have to be managed for. Okay, and so again, we need to get over to Dr. Miller, but I but I'm going to give you this question just to save the answer till till later. And so uh, in 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 this case, this is Nancy, and she's saying, "Hey, this might be a touchy." subject but what's what are the differences between sfi and fsc certification and how would you describe conservation values protection of birds and listed species and the differences in both certifications so again i'm not going to ask you to answer that now but you know if you can be think about a succinct answer for when dr miller is finished um one good one to think about all right take it away dr miller all right thanks jeff let me get my screen shared here and unfortunately, a couple of times during Dr. Sleep's presentation, um, I lost internet connection. So let's just keep our fingers crossed that doesn't happen. <laughs> okay, so thanks again. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, bird conservation and private forest lands and kind of tie what, what Dr. Sleep talked about into on the ground management. Uh, just briefly, just to introduce real quick who, who we are at NCASI. We're a nonprofit research organization driven by our member companies. Uh, we have about 100 member companies with about 29 million acres under management by those companies. So our members provide membership dues to us, and then we fund activities, research, and technical support for the collective benefit of that membership. And it's all focused on environmental and sustainability issues of concern for the forest product sector. And just to give you an idea within the forestry program, uh, we have uh, three main areas, sustainability and fiber supply, which includes forest certification, carbon and climate, and responsible chemical use, uh, primarily herbicides, uh, watershed and wetlands, looking at documenting effectiveness of forest practice rules and BMPs for water quality and quantity, and of course, biodiversity responses to forest management, and ever more so addressing at-risk species. And, uh, you know, this is a picture of a nice landscape of a managed forest. And uh, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about considerations for managing for biodiversity with the focus on birds in the context of active management on private lands. And provide some specific examples from the southeast, as this is the area where I am most familiar with. However, do be aware there's work in other regions of the country uh, that demonstrate the important relationships between active forest management and bird conservation. For a bit of context, it's important to understand the societal expectations I think we're all aware are, are changing around forest management. More people are aware of how managing forests is integral to the quality of life and importance of forests to maintain ecosystem services. And this is reflected in how forest landowners do business. And the, the most visible way this is, is through forest certification. And uh, as was discussed, the, there's an emphasis on stability objectives and forest owner business plans and increased awareness of forest for carbon and climate strategies as well. So that's kind of the broad backdrop and context of this. I do wanna mention real quick that I'm gonna uh, have some information from that, that is best summarized in two recent publications. Uh, the, one, uh, the one I show on the left, the systematic review of bird responses is focused on the Southeastern US. And there's some information I'll be pulling from this. And then the other one on the, on the other side of the screen is just a review that was done on generally the biodiversity value of managed forest that was done a number of years ago. But real, those are both really good sources of information if you're interested in learning more about these topics. And I'll add that although a lot of our products that we produce at NCASI are for our member companies, we do have publicly available information on our website. In this case, we have two fact sheets that may be of interest that are recent. One is managing for birds in the lake states, 
and the other one is more of a general forest management contributions of active forests in the southeastern U.S. So you can go to the website and look at those if you're interested. So this slide is a, shows a, a line graph of the increase in um, bird research on private forest lands focused in this case in the southeast from that Evans publication. And as you can see, there's been a, a great increase in that. Uh, and this, this review by Evans et al found 103 studies over the past 50 years on bird response to managed forest on private land in the southeast alone. And these publications were centered around uh, younger stand ages and herbicide use. As you can see, uh, I have it listed on the right hand side of the slide. So the point here is there is a large knowledge base of peer reviewed literature that documents uh, the value of active management for bird conservation. It's also important to recognize that as the issues have shifted for folks owners, owners and for forest owners and managers, so has the research. For example, in the Southeast, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, most of the research was on game, game species. Beginning in the 1980s, the present data has largely shifted to uh, non-game species and ever and, and even more recently to at-risk species. And constant throughout this evolution of, of knowledge has been a focus on bird communities because they respond so strongly to forest structure and they're a, they're a good group of species to, to look at for responses back to forest management. So I just want to set the stage a little bit here about private forest management. I'm sure most of you are aware of this. This map uh, from forest landowners shows the distribution of private and public forests across the U.S. And so it's clear from this and from what we know that private forests are critical for conservation. In fact, over half, 56% of forests in the U.S. are privately owned. And so uh, it's important to keep in mind. If we focus on the Southeast region, you can, this map just shows uh, management types in the Southeast region. 80% of the Southeast is privately owned, forest is privately owned. And it's important to recognize that the overall number one threat to these private forests are, is urbanization. And so it's important that we can maintain active management so that there's incentive to maintain forested acres uh, across the U.S. And, and in this case, in the Southeast in particular. So this picture is a, is, a, is a panoramic view of a managed forest in West Virginia. And it kind of show, gives you an idea of the diversity and, and what that, that forest landscape may look like. And this is really uh, at the course filter. And you know I'm gonna go back to what Dr. Sleep talked about, um, about the different scales of management. So uh, most, species need, uh, most species will have their needs met within this course filter. There's a different, ages, uh, stand types, forest types, and, and other features in this landscape that provide the needs for most species. And this creates a mosaic that is achieved on managed forest landscapes through sustainable forest management practices and the expectations set by forest certification and land stewardship. This includes managing harvest units, green up requirements, which green up is how soon you can harvest a stand adjacent to a stand that's been harvested, Retention of riparian zones, unique ecological communities, and other features on the landscape. And of course, this interacts with private managed forest with other land use types is also important, how this fits within the larger land use context. And when we talk about private forest in, in particular, and uh, this photo is an aerial photo from a actively managed forest, private forest landscape in central Mississippi that you can see the, the SMZ running through the middle and then the different stand ages represented on this photograph. On an actively managed landscape, there is a shifting mosaic of, of stand conditions. They're not static in space or time because of active management. So the cover shift over time, but if it's being managed sustainably, then the habitat supply can be relatively constant within these landscapes. This shifting mosaic landscape was first proposed uh, from a study in Maine in the 1990s by John Hagen and colleagues when describing bird diversity across forest landscapes managed for timber production. So the idea that this mosaic supports diverse wildlife communities and birds in particular is actually supported by a number of publications, including the review by Evans I just mentioned. And if we go to that review by Evans, we will see uh, this simple graphic just shows the uh, species richness in breeding and wintering that have been documented on Southeast managed forest landscapes shows a high diversity of birds, uh, uh, average of 51 species since studies since 1995, which really reflects modern forest management, which is much different now than it was prior to that time, with, with e even winter diversity estimates of, of up to 50 species as well. So the management regime especially uh, strongly influences 
the diversity of vegetation community in, in these managed stands uh, to which avian species directly respond. So these patterns of avian richness are influenced by the type of vegetation cover replaced by the planted stands, tree species planted, management regimes, set asides, and of course, the scale of measurement. But, but the take home here is that these managed forest landscapes support a diverse breeding bird community and wintering bird community. Uh, Dr. Sleep mentioned the work with SFI support with American Bird Conservancy, which was uh, uh, excellent work. E.J. Williams with, the, with ABC is the one that really spearheaded this. And this work was supported by SFI to really understand how we can manage birds on private forests. And some pretty interesting things. Um, if you look at this uh, uh, slide presentation from E.J., you can see that the conclusions from this work are that managed forests provide value to bird diversity and abundance at a regional scale, which I think is really important. We talk about regional conservation initiatives. That value can be increased by purposeful actions. In other words, understanding what the birds are, are using already through standard practices, and then what can we do a little bit different to maybe make it better for some of those species. And that the, that the harvest stand establishment and treatments of those forest stands provide that shifting mosaic of habitat conditions uh, within a with mostly stable and resilient forest and landscape. And so that just drives home the point about the value of active management for these bird communities. And if you look at some data from that project with American Bird Conservancy, uh, these are some, some area, this is an area in uh, East Central Mississippi and Western Alabama that we call the Aliceville landscape. And the, the bars show the breeding bird survey estimates for these various species. And then the green line shows the relative abundance of those based on uh, surveys done on SFI certified acres on private land. So you can see for northern bobwhite, there were more northern bobwhite on certified forest than there were in the breeding bird surveys. Similar for wood thrush, similar for Kentucky warbler, and a lot more prairie warblers. In fact, the prairie warbler provides a very interesting context. They need young forest of, of high quality. And we looked at prairie warblers in two focal areas here in Aliceville and also in New Bern, North Carolina, which is in eastern North Carolina. It was estimated that those two landscapes contain about 2% of the global population of prairie warblers on about 500,000 acres. So if you think about there are over 5 million acres of SFI certified forest in the southeast, not to mention the millions of acres of other forest lands remain. Similarly, the value for bird conservation, particularly for this species of concern, are, are pretty evident. So, at the, so for the most part, managers are making decisions on, on stand structure at the stand level. That's the scale at which management occurs. So forest harvest, either a final harvest or a thinning, uh, intermediate treatments such as fire, herbicide use, fertilization, uh, retaining features such as green trees, snags, retained patches. You can see in this slide, we've got uh, some, some snags and a retained patch from the Pacific Northwest and a, and a large cypress tree and an SMZ, just an example of those features. Uh, maintaining those riparian buffers, other management activities, directly influence the vegetation communities and how birds use them. Uh, snags are particularly important as they tend to be limited on these managed landscapes because of the rotation length and the, and the active management. So we, we can pay particular attention, attention to snags to really uh, help bird diversity on these landscapes. So it's useful to examine perhaps uh, bird response to management at various times during the rotation. And as I mentioned earlier, these examples are going to provide I'm going to provide her from the southeast, but they the principles in, in play here, active management and the shifting mosaic really apply to other regions as well. And there, there's been research and work done to document that as well. So if we focus on the southeast pine rotation real quick, I think most of you are familiar, you start with a clear cut harvest of an existing even age stand, establish a new stand, uh, some sort of intermediate thinning treatment to reduce the basal area of the trees that are left. Uh, mid-rotation management, which may be fertilization, herbicide use, or land or fire, and then a final harvest and the process starts over again, about 25 to 35 years in a, uh, a standard salt timber rotation. So I'm going to so this this I'm going to talk about median conservation value with a cup from a couple of studies, and all that is is a weighted mean. So it's the uh, it's the abundance of a species weighted by their partners in flight uh, conservation score. So a species that's, in, that's more important, so to speak, from partners in flight has a higher uh, value. And so this was from an early rotation study done with Mississippi State University and several NCASI members in South Mississippi that looked at a varying intensity of stand establishment 
with the, on the left, the blue line, the chemical being the least intensive all the way to the most intensive, which was two years of broadcast herbicide treatment, which is not uh, something that's done. Most of uh, the lands are managed somewhere between the second and third levels here. And what's interesting is that you can see the mean avian conservation value really jumps up in the stands that were chemically site prepared. And the reason for this is because, is a couple of reasons. One is that chemical site preparation there was no mechanical treatment, so snags weren't, were not removed from the stand. And the chemical treatment actually created more snags and, and small woody material that a lot more birds could use. There's also some evidence that the chemical treatment provided some growing space for the herbaceous plant community to recover over time. And I just wanna use this as an example to demonstrate how those management decisions affect how birds use these, these stands. And something else from this study, just to throw out here, that again, these are the same treatments. This is a line graph showing the, the plant species response. And as you can see, uh, after the first year, except for the most intensive treatments, the plant species richness was very similar among all the treatments. And even the most intensive treatments by the third or fourth year after treatment, they were also similar. And it just goes, it just demonstrates the temporary effects that, that herbicide treatments have on these plant communities. And in fact, uh, some other work that was done with this project demonstrated that that herbicide may have diversified plant communities in some of those uh, young plantations. So that's all pretty interesting. Uh, and a companion study was done in North Carolina through the University of Georgia. And this is just a, a quick representation of what we found there. So in those young forest stands, we found uh, documented 76 breeding birds, 40 species of grasses, 120 herbaceous species, and then uh, vines and a lot of woody species. And I wanna use this just as a demonstration that these young planted forests can be very diverse based on how they're managed. And of course, the more diverse the vegetation community is, the more diverse the bird community can be. And uh, just to kind of put the principles in place that this active management and, and managing these forests in a sustainable manner, and which is demonstrated through certification, really does provide benefits to, to the species that, that are using the, the landscape. So really from an early rotation standpoint, I think it's important to recognize the value of young forests for a lot of our bird species. A leaving structure is really important. This is a nice photo showing a landscape in the Western Gulf Coast in Arkansas that shows a, a little stringer going through with some mature pines left along a, along a small stream. Uh, not really a stream, probably just a ditch. And then you can kind of see the diversity in that young plantation in the foreground. Uh, and you know, there's some other things, management actions you can take that we don't have time to go into that can improve it for birds as well. So, you know, as, as any of the forest stand, you go through a closed canopy phase when you're in a managed plant, managed situation. And that closed canopy stage is usually pretty poor value for wildlife. It's uh, not much sunlight. The picture here shows a closed canopy stage with a lot of pine needles and not much else there. There's not a whole lot there if you're if you're a critter looking for, looking for groceries or a place to live. And uh, it used to be easy because you could just say, well, this isn't very good except we started finding Swainson's warblers in these plantations in, in the Southeast Gulf Coast. And uh, we did some work with Tulane University, uh, we being warehouser company, and um, documented that Swainson's warblers were actually settling in these closed canopy plantations before they were settling in bottom and hardwood cane thickets, which is their, their natural condition. And they had similar, if not greater, nest success. So these closed plantations in the right landscape can be really important for this particular species, which is one of high concern. So moving through, and we talk about the Southeast, as I think most of us know, the, uh, those systems are uh, maintained by fire. The pine systems were maintained by frequent fire that provided this open pine canopy condition of, of an open overstory, such as you see in this lava light pine plantation and a diverse hardwood understory. I mean, excuse me, a diverse herbaceous understory. But if you drive around in the Southeast, this is mostly what you see, right? This photo shows a, uh, a pine stem with a very strong hardwood midstory component. And all this may look nice, uh, we know that that hardwood midstory component shades out the diverse understory and is not very valuable from a wildlife standpoint. So the question is, in a managed forest, can we get from this back to this, uh, which is something we would all like to see more of on the landscape? And the answer is yes. Uh, and we can do this through a combination of, of selective herbicides and prescribed fire. Uh, we had a uh, a long-term project with Mississippi State University and several other partners, Warehouser Company, National Wild Turkey Federation, BASF, and some other folks to actually ask that question, can we manage thin lava light pine plantations in an open pine condition? 
And so this article it was recently published just a couple of years ago that, that looked at this uh, looked at this long term study. And so what we did, let me back up. So what we did is we had about 11 years where we managed stands with fire and herbicide and tracked the species response. And so uh, we had six replicated treatments of, of four treatments, uh, burn only, herbicide only, which was a single herbicide treatment in the fall. And then an herbicide, single herbicide treatment followed by prescribed fire every three years, and then a burn only every three years. And so what we found from that study across all of those different stands, we documented 63 uh, breeding birds and over 300 species of plants. And so again, the diversity within those plantation systems uh, can, can be quite good. So this slide, I'll just explain a little bit. Uh, I, I know it's not the most attractive slide, but this just shows uh, the, the, the bird communities over time. This is the meaning of being conservation value again. 1999 on the left was the pre-treatment year. You can see that all of our stands, control was the first one, then burn only, then the herbicide, then the herbicide burn, are all very similar. So the red lines in 99, 2002, and 2005 indicate when we burn those stands. And what you'll notice is the very first year, actually the second year after 2001, you'll notice that the mean avian conservation value was greater for the burnt herbicide stands than the other stands. And that maintained all the way through almost to the end of the study. And toward the end of the study, that drops out a little bit, probably because at that point, the overstory pine trees were starting to do some shading of their own. Uh, so I think it's really important to recognize that you can manage those stands for those higher avian conservation values. I also want to point out that the most similar treatment to the herbicide burn treatment was the herbicide only treatment. And the reason for that is because the herbicide treatment eliminated those mid-story hardwoods. They're not going to come back when they've been treated appropriately. Um, and we didn't start treating these stands until about five years after they were thin. So the hardwoods were already so well established that a burn by itself could not control them. And that combination of those two treatments was really effective. Um, and so the other good news about this study is that all of these stands were clear cut harvested in 2010 after we had studied them for 11 years. And then we applied early rotation treatments. So we now have followed the same stands from 1999 to 2000 to 2021. And a PhD student at Mississippi State, Rebecca Bracken, is working on using these stand level data to model avian communities across the entire rotation at the landscape scale to further understand that shifting mosaic in bird communities. So there's more to come. Uh, this will be a, a data set that is uh, un unmatched anywhere else, I believe, an entire rotation of data on, on bird response. So the key takeaways from that work is that the open canopy conditions can be maintained, uh, that herbicide and burning are effective treatments for bird conservation. There's really, we also looked at other species, and there's a wide diversity of value for those things. So stepping back to the landscape, this, this photo is, is from a uh, recent, from that Evans publication, and uh, it just shows kind of the forest cycle and the turnover of avian communities. You go from cutting on the lower left all the way around to young stands, to older stands, and then of course the riparian zone in the middle. And, and there's just a list of some of the bird species associated with those different four stages. So this is just an overview of that bird diversity through a rotation. And we didn't talk about SMZs or set aside areas, but these areas are common on managed forest and add diversity. SMZs in particular, which are part of forestry BMPs, help to maintain mature forest structure on the landscape, including larger trees and snags. Uh, in a study in the West Gulf Coastal Plain, 17% uh, of landscapes were composed of SMZs, but had 27% of the avian diversity. Uh, the narrow SMZs had early successional species with them, and the wider SMZs had interior hardwood species. So again, with the landscape perspective, having a mixture of main stands with these SMZs and other set-aside areas really increases the diversity of those stands. So the final uh, scale we talked about was a, was a fine filter. We recognize that there are species that need special management. Uh, restricted range, specific habitat requirements. Uh, this photo is a winter image of a planted wobbly pine stand as part of a safe harbor agreement for red cockaded woodpeckers in Louisiana. Uh, this landowner is managing over 40,000 acres for RCWs with an agreement to maintain a number of breeding pairs. The requ this requires frequent burning, longer rotations, and provisions of foraging habitat that is different than business as usual. So, you know, this is a great example of a fine filter approach to managing for a species of concern on a managed forest landscape. So just to kind of kind of summarize real quick uh, before I talk just a few minutes about another, another thing is the importance of keeping forests in forest. And research has clearly indicated the value of managed forests for diversity of wildlife species. 
And uh, research has also shown that one of the primary motivations for maintaining forest cover is economic return. So it's important we maintain healthy markets and active forest management to encourage landowners to maintain forest cover, which will benefit uh, a, lot of, a lot of these species. Okay, I know I'm going fast because I know the time is getting down, but I think I'm doing pretty good. I got a few minutes left. Uh, so what I want to touch on real quick is a project uh, called the called the Wildlife Conservation Initiative is a partnership primarily through NAFO, the National Alliance of Forest Owners, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NCASI, SFI, and some other partners, some state agencies, and, and some other folks as well. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with NAFO, NAFO is the Trade Association for Large Private Landowners. So, uh, and uh, so the vision of this is within the conservation without conflict that working farms, forests, and ranches contribute to species conservation, and are working together. Uh, collaboratively with regulatory agencies and, and with private landowners provide conservation success. The goal is to have voluntary proactive approaches for conservation to keep working forests working or working lands working to achieve uh, conservation benefits and to provide conservation at scale. So if we step down to the Wildlife Conservation Initiative, some of the tenets of that are that the NAFO members act, work that proactively conserve at risk of listed species. And I should add that to be a member of NAFO, you have to operate sustainably, which is usually shown through forest certification of, of some type. And then recognizing that forest certification is important. Uh, NAFO members are also working collaboratively with the Bureau of Fish and Wildlife Service. And one of the goals is to establish a trust relationship that we can have those conversations we need to to conserve conservation on private land. Um, and I will mention that, that NAFO brings about 49 million acres of, of managed forest to the to the table. So for the Wildlife Conservation Initiative, there is a broad support for including private forest landowners that are integral to species conservation. Uh, sound science is foundational to success. Uh, NCASI's role in this is really to help provide that science on biodiversity relationships on managed forest. We do have tools available to achieve this conservation success and they're working collaboratively with mutual trust is essential. Essential. This quote from Wendy Weber with the Fish and Wildlife Service and Jimmy Bullock with RMS, uh, who was really the architect of a lot of this, along with Cindy Donor when she was the director for the Southeast region, is that working collaboratively toward conservation goals can conserve wildlife species and help support our shared values and ownership objectives on private lands. And so, um, you know, as I mentioned, NAFO members bring about 46 million acres of forest land under active management. Uh, NCASI brings over 50 years of research expertise in forest private lands. Certification provides third party verification of forest sustainability. And of course, the Fish and Wildlife Service provides expertise and regulatory authority for species of conservation. Um, and the, the underlying tenet here is that active forest management, forest certification, and DMP implementation are integral to conservation. So what I just want to mention real quick is we are actively engaged in this process. We have projects in six U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regions. We have over, so far, over $1.2 million of funding, largely from the service, but from others to do this work, this research on the ground to understand at-risk species. In Region 1 uh, in West Virginia, we're engaged in a, a bird project with West Virginia University with a focus on golden warblers, cerulean warblers, and wood thrush. In Region 2, we have a project looking at aquatic and terrestrial species. We've also collected data through American Bird Conservancy on that landscape. We're using eDNA and some other surveys to look at aquatic and vertebrate communities, also gopher tortoises and red hills salamanders. In Region 3 in the Lake States, we have a project looking at wood turtles. Region 6 is mussel surveys, which is going to be in western Louisiana. Out west, we have projects on red tree voles, pollinators, and the uh, Pacific martin, and also on western pond turtles. And so all of this work is underway and ongoing, and we are continuing to look for partners through state agencies and others that are interested in collaborative work and continue to move forward with this strategic vision of, of successful conservation collaboration on private lands and building those long-term lasting relationships with the service uh, to benefit uh, the private landowners, the service, and of course, the species we're trying to conserve. All right, so that's all I had, and I think I did that fairly well. So thanks, Jeff. Great job, Dr. Miller and Dr. Sleep. So, so there are quite a few questions. We clearly won't get to all of them. I am gonna, so I'm gonna toss this one quickly to Dr. Miller. And, and so this goes to the mosaic kind of concept when you were talking about the, 
you know, landscape conservation. And, and this is from Georgina, and she says, uh, if managed forests provide value at a regional scale, who is overseeing, hang on, I flipped that down too far. Oh, I really did lose it, hang on here. If managed forests provide value at a regional scale, who is overseeing that to make sure that the regional scale is working out rather than it being a death by a thousand cuts at the local scale? Yeah, Jeff, that's that is a great question. And so, uh, and I, I, if I misspeak, Dr. Sleep, please let me know. One of the expectations under SFI, in particular, is to cooperate in regional conservation actions and plans to help have that coordination. Uh, one of the reasons it's so great to work at the regional level with Fish and Wildlife Service is we can have those con conversations about what those managed forests provide in the landscape. Um, in concert with what other land uses are providing, whether it, it's public land, uh, non-industrial private landowners, or agriculture, all those things. And so really, you have to engage in those con regional conservation plans to, uh, to be able to really understand the whole picture. And that's something that, that uh, SFI uh, promotes and that the, the member companies try to, our member companies try to get engaged in. And, you know, in as an organization, we work all across the U.S. and Canada, and we can also help provide that coordination among our member companies and with those other other land agencies. So hopefully that, that helps answer a little bit. Yeah, it does. So that, so also, and I see, I see both our, both our speakers were answering some of the questions in the chat. <laughs> and of course, unfortunately, the uh, folks can't see those answers, but what we'll do is say, um, we may ask you guys to answer a couple of the others we won't get to today, and then we'll send sure. it out to everyone. So, um, so, so Charles says, and again, this one was already answered, so I'll let you guys answer it quickly. In 2008, the USDA Forest Service declared white-tailed deer the greatest threat to eastern forests after habitat conservation. How do you address deer browse in private forests in order to support regeneration of of healthy forests and and to support forest layers that support birds. Yeah, well, Jeff, I'll say I do I do my part during deer season every year to try try to reduce that browse pressure locally. Uh, but all of the large landowning companies, uh, all or most of them, have either uh, hunting lease programs or open access programs uh, to allow folks to to recreationally uh, hunt and enjoy those properties and. And in most cases in the eastern U.S., especially the primary species of interest are, are white-tailed deer. Uh, you could certainly have a long discussion if we're if we're have harvest levels sufficient to to make a difference. Uh, but uh, you know there is an opportunity to to deal with that on private lands to a degree. I I, I will just say that the you know that 30-year Cornell study says yeah hunting alone may not be enough, but you know some people differ with that. So here's another question that both that's really relevant to both you guys. Let me pull it up here, and it relates to carbon storage and and sequestration. Let me just um, find this quickly. Um, what actions by forest industry are being taken to maximize carbon sequestration and storage while minimizing greenhouse gas emissions associated with all aspects of forest management and product processing? So well, I uh, started answering. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I, I put an answer into the, in the chat on that one uh, as well, Jeff. Uh, so in this recent round of uh, revisions to the SFI standard, we put a whole new objective into the standard focused on climate smart forestry. Uh, there's two major components to that particular objective. One is requiring certified organizations to do a, a an in-depth analysis of the risks uh, and uh, and likely effects of climate change to their forests and thinking about how to adapt to that. So developing adaptation plans to uh, the very likely risks and perils to their forests. And the second element is to look at uh, sort of the carbon dynamics they're dealing with, reducing uh, carbon emissions through, uh, you know, practices, what equipment they use, where they use it, how they develop the road networks, all that sort of thing, and try and reduce emissions that way, while at the same time looking to ways they can increase sequestration on their landscape uh, in terms of uh, uh, whether it's silviculture practices or, or who knows what uh, to uh, increase sequestration and protect the the carbon, in particular the carbon that's, that's located in the soils already. Uh, so we we've actually put a new requirement into the standard uh, focused on carbon uh, mitigation and sequestration. 
So, th so thanks, Darren. So why, just while you were talking a little bit about standards, and maybe you guys both have something to add to this, but earlier on we talked about the differences. There was a question about the differences between the Forest Stewardship Council, FSC, and, and uh, Sustainable Forest Initiative, SFI. So do you guys want to just say how, how they work well, together or, how, or which, you know, how you might yeah. differentiate them? Well, yeah, yeah, we're, just, we're both, we're both just, chafing at that one. <laughs> no, just 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 real just real quick. I'll let Darren take this, but just real quick, I think the important thing to understand is those certification systems are certified by another organization, PEFC, and all three of those, all three being FSC, SFI, and American Tree Farm System Certification System, all contain the essential elements for sustainable forest management. They, their approaches may be different, and the specific language may be different, but the base uh, uh, goal is is the same through all three of them. Thank you. Yeah, uh, fully agree. And, and what what Darren's omitting in that is that he's got I forget what the number is. Darren, twenty one, twenty two years working with warehousers. So uh, he sat on the other side of that table, uh, trying to meet the standards. Uh, uh, you know, both FSC and SFI at various points. Uh, so he's got a, a lot more experience looking at at uh, sort of both both shop windows, if you will, and and figure out how to do it. Uh, but one of the key differences that we see, uh, and I think this is just the, the way the two standards approach uh, forest management, uh, SFI is an outcomes based uh, standard. We, we rely on certified organizations to reach a conservation or a, or a management objective, whereas FSC is a, a rules based system. It's a prescriptive system where they, uh, they guide what is to be done to get to the outcome. So it's, it's just uh, looking at the same. Uh, the same result from a different angle. Okay, so so thanks for that. Uh, let me let, let's uh, again. We we're a few minutes after the hour, but I'm good. But if folks are up for staying around, uh, we'll we still ask. have 187 people listening. So yeah, so it's um, <laughs> just wanted to grab one here related to. So, so this one I thought was a little different, and I think so. On the west coast, young and regen stands represent an increased fire severity risk. Do these certifications take that into account when assessing sustainability? And uh, another one that I, I put some uh, information into the chat. Um, essentially, an, another part of the newly revised stand that we just completed is a new objective around fire resilience and awareness. And one of the things we require certified organizations to do is look at fire risk across their landscape, uh, look at fuel loads, look at fire severity risk, look at all that, that information they have available to them, and think about how to manage their, their landscape to reduce risk of severe wildfires or wildfires at all to their forests. So that's, that's something that we are now requiring within the standards specifically. And that's you know, largely in response to you know, the increasing risk of wildfire that we're seeing out west. And I'll, I'll just add real quick to that, Jeff, that, you know, those companies depend on the sustainably managed management of those forests for their livelihood to, to meet their expectations, their shareholders. And so it's, it's incumbent upon them as well to understand and mitigate that fire risk to protect them, their business interests. And so, you know, above the ecological, it's also the economic part of that that's really important. So it, it's something that we see our members talking about a lot right now of how to mitigate that, how to understand it, what they need to do. Right. Okay. So it, this one, this one's a pretty specific question, and I think we'll end again. There's some good questions in here, so you guys stim stimulated some some good thoughts, and and so we appreciate the audience really paying attention here. But this one's from Kristen, and it's it's talking about working with private landowners. There's often a lot of education involved in changing their management practices or lack thereof to improve their forested stands. Doesn't it? Does Enkazi have resources that translate these data to actionable steps for a layperson? And if so, do they take into account the financial limitations of a private landowner in implementing management actions? So there's a lot, a lot happening in that question. Well, I know, I know, uh, Kristen can't answer, but I know her very well, and glad she's on. And good, good, to, good to hear a question from you, Kristen. Hope you're doing well. Um, so the short answer is, is yes. One of the things that NCASI does is translate scientific information to uh, technical information we can provide to remember companies to help inform them. And uh, in a lot of cases, it's also to help them uh, economically meet their management objectives. 
And so uh, we do provide those resources to our member companies. Either they'll ask us directly or we, we have a variety of mechanisms to get that information to them. And, um, and, and so really, you know, in a lot of cases, I mean, I'm trying to think, I try not to belabor this too much, but um, one of the best resources to answer that question are, are, are the company or the foresters. Uh, the best thing you can do is say, this is what I want this to look like. How do I get there? And let the experts tell you how to get there. And uh, our companies, our member companies certainly have that expertise internally to do, to make that, to turn those, uh, those activities into action. Uh, I mentioned that long-term burn herbicide study and also the early rotation study. We didn't dictate what though, what to do to get those stands in the condition they were in. We said, this is what we want. How do we do it? And so I think it's really important to understand that you have that technical resource of professional foresters to, to help translate that information as well. I hope that answered her question. I, I think it did. And I just tossed this to Dr. Sleep, which is so, again, and I think you saw this in, in there. I think it was Charles that was asking about, you know, do, do um, most organizations have the depth and interdisciplinary approach? Again, foresters, may understand a little bit about a lot of taxa, but they're not going to be experts on all taxa or all birds. And so I personally found FAR certification to really bring together a real interdisciplinary staff to really engage in, in management issues instead of the forester being out there by themselves, just being, you know, basically thrown the stones thrown at them uh, in the review process to a really a collaborative approach. So I just wondered if you might, you know, share how organizations take that interdisciplinary approach and ha where they can get help from if they need to take that approach? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I, again, I, I made some comments in the chat about that. Uh, we see a wide variety across of certified organizations in the, in the US and Canada, you know, some very large, you can, you can think of a very large institutional organizations that have, you know, lots of interdisciplinary uh, professionalism on staff. And then there are a lot of smaller companies that just don't have that clout. They've got maybe a forester or two, which, as Darren pointed out, are incredibly valuable resources, but they don't have necessarily a biologist or, or, or all these other, you know, you know, you know, botanists and stuff on staff to do that, that sort of work. So what we encourage within the SFI standard is, is involvement with the standard implementation committees, which brings the smaller landowners, the smaller organizations in close proximity to the bigger organizations that, that can then uh, sort of share resources, pool resources, uh, and and collaborate. And then, you know, if, if we're talking about SFI, uh, we do a lot of collaborations, a lot of uh, across a lot of different organizations, including uh, ENGOs and universities uh, and organizations like NCASI. Uh, you know, we all work together and and bring that uh, multidisciplinary expertise to the table to help those companies that don't necessarily have the the uh, wherewithal to to have that sort of thing on staff. Dr. Miller, anything to add? Yeah, yeah, Jeff, thank you. And I would add that uh, that one reason we have people that members of NCASI is because we provide that technical expertise back to member companies. So within the forestry mm -hmm. program, we have wildlife scientists, forest hydrologists, biometricians, toxicologists on staff. And so for some of those companies that don't have that critical mass of folks internally, they rely on us for that information. And I'll also add just real quick that I talked about the Wildlife Conservation Initiative. That is directly linking member companies, private landowners to the Fish and Wildlife Service and state agencies to where we can share those resources and information with each other uh, to have that expertise where we need it to understand those issues and be able to address things. Right. And since we're talking to a, a wildlife ecologist and a zoologist, you know, we appreciate the, uh, uh, the shared knowledge here, but obviously you guys are very deep in the forest. So, but this was a great presentation um, and really appreciate your time sharing with the, our, our group. And I see a lot of our attendees hung on, you know, to ask some questions and we greatly appreciate that. We have a pretty good audience. And so I, since uh, both Dr. Sleep and Dr. Miller had a head start on answering these questions, I have a feeling that they're willing to answer the rest of them, and we'll send them out within a week or two to our to everyone that participated. And I'll just remind folks again: November 16th is our next uh, discussion on indigenous and traditional practices in in forest management. So, with that, thanks again. Darren Sleep and Darren Miller, really appreciate your time. Great presentations, and thank you to everyone that joined us today. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff.